Hello and welcome. My name is Johannes and I'm the host of the show. Today I am here with Alan Tomini, who is an accomplished data scientist, um, a development engineer, a data scientist at Petroleum Experts. He's an experienced and creative petroleum engineer, software development specialist and data scientist with a demonstrated history of delivering value to the oil and energy industry. A broad range of experience from machine learning and AI to reservoir engineering, field management and optimization, process and flow assurance, moving on up through the value chain to developing and deploying the digital oil field. A rigorous academic background and over a decade of mentoring and training other scientists and engineers. Hello, Alan. How are you today? Hello, I'm fine, Let's thank you. Great, great. So let's get into this really interesting topic that we, we have for today, which is uh, large language models, of which the very famous chat GPT everyone is chatting about is a part. So uh, <laughs> yeah, let's get into that. And let's start, I guess, with an overview of what are large la uh, language models to begin with. And then we can differentiate a little bit what chat GPT is, because it is turns out it's not quite only that. So we get, we'll, we'll get into that. So yeah, if you could give us a little introduction to the topic of large language models. So yeah, so basically a, a large language model is effectively, uh, it, it, it's the where AI is at the moment, really, when it comes to sort of interacting with um, with the real world. You know, there's a, a great sort of schematic diagram that you'll see where you have sort of data science as a big blob. And then inside of data science, you'll see machine learning. And then inside of that, you'll have AI. And large language models are kind of a, another dimension on that because effectively they are the inside the AI bubble, but they are largely speaking software. Um, and the reason I'd say software is because they, they sort of differentiate from just simply being a quite a dense neural network that can you know work out some some text or differentiate between some categories or some images um, and they they have logic in the background that then kind of takes the output of these AI models or deep learning models and then uses them to kind of reconstruct something on the other end and, and then spit it out so it's a, it's a software um, developed AI system. Uh, and there's been a number of them for, for a number of years. I mean, ChatGPT is obviously the big one that everyone's really excited about and have been talking about. Um, and I've been, you know, creating column inches for, for months now for uh, with ChatGPT. But for, for, you know, some time, a lot of companies like Meta and, and Google um, have been generating them. There's some open source ones. Uh, Goose AI have been doing stuff like that um, for, for some time. Um, but they're, they're really... Um, at the forefront of, of what people are beginning to see and interact with when it comes to kind of AI. And, and it's the this kind of, uh, people are getting A, really excited about using it, and B, a little bit scared about what it means for, for us all going forward. And then, you know, I think, I think we'll probably end up talking a little bit about both of those topics. <laughs> so um, let me just, uh, uh, can we go one step deeper and can we just look into the workings of that. How how does such a model work? And so so the the basics of the model are effectively that you you have an API interface that will uh, interpret your 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 text your input. Usually that will be through some sort of NLP, um, which is natural language processing. So uh, there'll be a, a, a text point. And that will then kind of move into an algorithmic background where effectively you're going to have some methodology for search and understanding what's going on in, in, a, in a database kind of format. But you'll also have another part of it that will have kind of a, a generative uh, part of it. And the generative part can be quite complex in some cases. You can have um, a generative algorithm that will basically create 
you know, text based on what you input. So there'll be a natural language processing part to this sort of a UI part of it, uh, where the it will interpret what you want. That will then categorize what you what you think what it thinks you want. So say I say I want you to write me a story about kittens. Then basically it's going to kind of say okay story kittens, and it knows what a story is. It's going to say right that that's going to be a bunch of text. And the generative part is kittens. So the keyword identifiers um, in there will kind of spin up and say right this person wants a large amount of text about kittens. It doesn't want a picture of a kitten made out of text. You know, there, there's a that's where the AI part comes in uh, to try and understand what it is the person wants. And then basically, the generative parts can be quite complex. You can get, um, it can basically begin to sort of look for and, and understand what there is to do with you know a story structure. Uh, do you want characters and all this kind of stuff? And and that that's a large amount of that is based on how it's been generated and trained and created. Uh, and what it's been allowed access to during its development phase. So has it been allowed access to, you know, a database of books by, you know, a bunch of Gothic writers or a bunch of kids, uh, you know, authors and, and kids stories. And it'll basically create a story based on what you wanted uh, and then spit out the other end. So there'll be, and then the, so basically it has to kind of come back around and, and print you out a story based on what you put into it. So there's there's lots and lots of layers and levels in these models that basically create uh, this sort of um, categorical sense and then it will spit out the numbers at the bottom of it, basically. It, it's type it's a type of transformer, right? If if I'm if I'm correct about it. Yeah. Or yeah, at the heart of speaking. it, or there's a part, speaking, part of it. These things, yeah. yeah, yeah. At, at the bottom end of it, it, it is a a large, massively parallelized process of 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 number crunching, and you know all the all the pieces of text will have a number or numerical format, and effectively there'll be a large bank of GPUs somewhere processing a bunch of this data and turning it into into what you think, what you see when it comes out of your screen. So, is it true to say that because um, I suppose you know it, it it is it's sort of like one of those models that predicts one word at a time or does it does it predict phrases at a time or it is sort of it, it is a, f a form of predictive model right if i understand it right so that that it, it predicts sort of what comes next after uh is, is that right is that how you would characterize it yeah so yeah so a lot of these a lot of these models are uh, and and they're, they're kind of recursive so they they'll basically um once you once a pattern begins then it will it, it's almost like committing itself to a path. It, it, once a pattern begins, there will be an end to that. And effectively, there there might be some sort of degree of randomness added to it to give it a certain amount of, um, just a certain amount of kind of realism. And um, one of the things in machine learning, and, and, it, and certainly when we do a lot of uh, dense models, there's a kind of a, you, you kind of sometimes drop some parts of your model just to kind of see if you can just whittle away and trim away some of the things that you might not want to keep in your finished product. Uh, and that's a kind of a semi-random process. I mean, obviously you want to start from kind of a known point, but but then generate a kind of a random process. So there can be a certain amount of randomness in these models, but very often what happens is because it's recursive, there'll be a starting point, some sort of seed, some grain of what the user is imparted into the model, and it will then begin to kind of spin and at that point, it starts to sort of look back and say, right, well, I was talking about something for the past couple of sentences or phrases or words. I'm going to keep going in that route. So it starts to input its own output into the, the generation of, of, the, of the model. So, um, And that then tends to kind of, uh, it, it can lead to some funny stuff. I think a lot of, a lot of the articles that you'll see about, about these models is where they talk about how they've generated just some nonsense. It, it comes from processes like that, I believe. That's my understanding, where they kind of, it, it starts to just say something that is just complete gibberish. And, and you think to yourself, how did you get to 200 words of that? <laughs> but it's just because it sort of kept going down its little path and thought, right, I'm finished. Here you go. Here's my answer. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, but but there's something. Okay, before we get into 
okay, ChatGPT is a bit different, right? So there's, it seems to be yeah. out of all of them, the most coherent one or the one that makes the most coherent sense when it speaks, right? Or when it chats yes. away. So that's very interesting. There, there, there are new, uh, so, so before it, it seems like they've been working on this for quite some time now. I've, I've been reading about mm -hmm there are various such approaches obviously none of us can train such such a model right so so we're, we're both data scientists and we neither of us can possibly have trained it right why is that because it's too much yeah. compute power right that we don't have so that's uh so so there is that um and so so um but but you can read about it it's very it's very clear how it's done they they do disclose quite a lot about it so so for one thing ChatGPT is based on GPT-3, right? That's which is the large language model, or at least GPT-3 is a part of it, right? And then there are other aspects as yeah. well, right? Uh, such as Codex, which is a, a, a very interesting, um, also uh, produced by Open by OpenAI, um, a, a product that that basically helps you code. <laughs> in a sort of a uh, that that is also behind a tool that is already rolled out. Uh, on, uh, on GitHub, if I'm if I'm right, so it's there, there seems to be a partnership with Microsoft involved there because Microsoft owns GitHub, if I'm if I'm correct, and so they're using this thing, okay. Open AI Codex. So GitHub Copilot is based on Codex as well. So but but Codex is right. also underneath ChatGPT, right? So that's it's very interesting how they 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 fit these. It seems as, as though there's a modular approach at work here where there's several modules yeah. that have been developed in isolation and then are, are combined in ChatGPT and that makes this, gives this ChatGPT such power. Is that, is that the right way to read it? Yeah. I, I think that, that, that's kind of, <clears throat> yeah. And I think that, that, that must be the, that there must be something else. And this is the thing uh, often with, with like uh like software, it's the bit that they don't tell you about that's the, the, the revolutionary part. I mean, they're being very open about, you know, GPT-3 GPT being kind of the, the part of it. And, and you know, there's there's hundreds of applications using GPT-3 under the hood. And, you know, so, and, the, you know, the open AI has been, you know, distributing it quite, quite happily for a long time. And like you say, it's kind of, it's been used for things like, uh, you know, the, the, when you're using Git, um, GitHub and, and stuff like that to help people with coding, and, and that's quite that's quite useful. Obviously, there's obviously some kind of very very well built code model, and it's actually interesting that it's the, it's the GitHub people that have done it because if anyone's got a huge amount of code in their database to train something on, it's going to be GitHub, you know. And that's that's interesting. And that's like the so when you do if you do like a, a, a you know the TensorFlow kind of certification or, or or some of these Google kind of courses, and um, one of the models that they'll help you that they'll do as like a part of the courses is the 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 one where they took the, uh, the that huge picture repository and they trained the image recognition on the on the picture repository Inception Inception yes 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 Inception. Yeah. Yes. It's it's available Inception actually a trained version. Of, I think a, yeah. a, a trained version so of this is available on uh, so TensorFlow Hub. Massive. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So you can take that, but that was trained using um, some massive online repository of images to, to categorize images, which is is perfect because, like you said, it's not something that that we could do. I mean, I've you know I've basically got pictures of dogs, cats, and my kids running around my garden. So unless there's those are the categories i want to get i want to get i'm not going to be able to you know build a model that can do that so so these people have you know obviously done something with the code side of things but that's that's going to be you know a huge a huge asset but then then what they've done obviously for chat gpt is put this together in a really clever way and that's the bit that, that that's the bit that interests me i think where, where you uh Sometimes when you you're building physics based models, um, you you need to go back to really simple concepts to try and get these things to work. So you can go for like like minimum action or least action, um, in terms of physics based models, and that's kind of one of these things that a lot of 
you know, to like look for like a, a rope that's dangling between two poles. You can kind of calculate and model that or simulate that and, and look for like least action uh, in the little bits between the, the, the rope. And it's a really simple physics-based concept. Or you could try and kind of really model the, the you know, tensile strength and all that kind of stuff in the rope, but it's kind of not going to, it's going to be difficult. And um, so I really hope that the chat GPT guys have figured out something really, really simple about putting these things together. And that's where the stability comes from. Because the simplest concepts usually lead to the most stable output, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's quite, yeah. So, so now let's, okay, that's, yeah, so that's that, great. So we, we, we have to admit that we don't know everything yeah. about it, right? So G, G, uh, ChatGPT is somewhat yeah. a partial mystery to most of us, I suppose. And then partially we know <laughs> yes. this, but we do know what, how large language models work, generally speaking. But, uh, and, and then we also know that there is um, another element that ChatGPT seems to be this, this human supervision, or uh, I guess they call it machine teaching. Where, where people, you know, like you said, there's a story about a cat, right? And a story about a cat. Now we're going to tell you whether that story was good or bad, right? And then humans will sit there and say, okay, well, that story is not as good as the other one you wrote and so on. And, it, and then it, it knows, it gets feedback. So in, in a similar way as we would when we, when we do things, uh, you know, we, we will read it to our friends and they will say, well, that one is good or this one's not so good. Do you have to add some, you know? And so then there, there are some elements of that that, is, that are, kind of similar to to the way humans would learn to write better stories um and and there is this um so so the human in the loop is certainly there and even they write about it right they're writing about even that the customizability of it uh, that they're working on is really interesting as well so they're um this this uh, we we briefly talked about this in, in a previous episode with with dorothea bauer about the 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 you know what what one might call democratization of of these kinds of tools and we raised some issues there with that and even the meaning of it but the point being that it's very interesting that you can then um, use your own values you can in a way teach the ai your values um, the system your values and then it will represent and write it not only with your style so so the style i suppose was the first improvement that they did right so you can now write in the style of i don't know <laughs> ellen Tommy, right like i could write in your style right? i can borrow your style of writing but but the next step is the values so the ethical values and the ideas of wh how you interpret the world and and what you find uh, good and bad in the world it can actually take on or or that will be the next step they're, they're not quite there yet I, I, they're they're writing about how how they're planning on doing this and then interestingly, you will not be able to blame it on the AI anymore. So you will say, well, um, the AI helped me write it, but, um, but it's me. It's my, it's my, these are my values. And this, this is what it's just representing me essentially. And I guess that's, that's a good thing, right? And, and more or less, I think that's, that's an interesting new direction that it's taking. I find it's a good, re a good thing because it's also yeah, the responsibility goes to the writer, right? So you can say things that are racist, but it'll be you saying it. It won't be the AI, it'll actually be you. The AI is just helping you to do it faster and to do more of it. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, that's, that's the thing. It, 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 it's, it's basically, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of ups the entropy in the room. I mean, you kind of, you can basically have as you can create lots of content. And that's one of the, the main, you know, the main early applications for these things was kind of just content creation, just keep, keep making content. But I think in the, the GPT-3 API, you have these, these things called prompts. So you give it your prompts and then you, you say, okay, these are my, these are, they, this is what I look like and how I sound and this is what I write like. And then you can kind of give it your input and then it should come out with something that would sound and look like you, but you know, that's how you, you've done it. And I think that's, and I, I would hope that that's that's the future for something like Chat GPT. I mean, it's as a as a cool little website on the internet where people can go and like type little cool things in and get stuff out. That's that's cute, but the the application of this has to be some manner of of API that can be called by other things. You know, it's um, you know that that has to be the the, the evolution of it, and then, and then it, it then it's the like you say, and and like you say that the impetus is on 
people to adapt to it and people to use it responsibly, obviously. But um, you know, and and but it's not the it's not the AI's fault when someone uses it as a bad actor because effectively that person or you know per, or you know company or corporation was, was going to try and do that. That's been it on their mind. They've just found a tool, you know. So um, it, it's kind of a it's a difficult one. And and from an academic point of view, when you're doing you know, people people using it to kind of summarize scientific papers to help them write their reports. That's you know that's fine, um, but I, I think it's it, it's on the maybe the the, the lecturers and the, the tutors to kind of try and find ways of using that and creating a course that can't be manipulated by that kind of action. You need to um, people need to we need to sort of adapt to these things and kind of br- bring the the fact that this exists into our into our way of working and our way of living and, and just kind of keep moving. You know, that's kind of how it works. Yeah, I agree. Well, we have to teach humans how to use it well, right? And that's that's one thing. And that's also a moving target, right? It will be changing as we go along. So you can't just make a university course of writing where you include ChatGPT as part of the experience of writing now, but you have to actually update it all the time and you have to make people aware that they have to update their knowledge on it because it's com- con- continuously moving and it's in it's becoming a bit of a dialogue right so we can put we can tell it to improve itself and it will do that uh, you know under certain circumstances so also okay that's that's great the other question is you know who's going to read all of this text right so now we are able to every one of us is able to write mountains of books but is that meant to for human consumption because you know we're, we're not, you know why why should we read all of that um, AI generated uh, text, right? Is is it really valuable? And that that's that's you know the next question. I think that should come. You know why is that valuable? Why is that not more valuable for it to come from a human experience? It's not embodied. Can it really teach us something new? Can it be creative in a way that will benefit us when we read it? What what do you think of that? What do you think about these things? Well, that's. Yeah, I mean that that's that's one of the the, the sort of dangers, and, and certainly I think I, honestly I think economics is probably going to drive the, the the hardest against that because effectively you could in theory have just one of these um, large language large language models just churn novels. You know, you, you could just say write me a billion books on any subject you want, and you know, it could generate terabytes and terabytes of data. And, and, you know, you could have it, you know, have it spitting out like the congressional library's worth of books every couple of days. But no one's going to pay for that compute power. First of all, someone at some point is going to go, where is this Where is this bill coming from? And then also you've got to pay for the storage of that. So that's got to get stored somewhere. And it's going to be on an Amazon or an Azure or a Google Cloud somewhere. So someone's going to be paying for that. And I think that I think the economics is going to push back against that a little bit. But that is a danger. But storage. You know, could come back in, you know. Yeah, storage seems to be quite quite uh, cheap these days. But yeah, churning out, I mean, compute power, I think, is more expensive. But then at the same time, it does it cost a lot of compute power to to do it? Well, I guess that would be called inference, right? The, traditionally, we say when when we use a trained model, we call it inference uh, versus yes, training, right? So we, we we should yeah, because we should make this differentiation. Yeah, and uh, this distinction, order, right? Because, less. Yeah, definitely. Yes, yes, because the, the training we know that training is monstrous when it comes to energy usage. So the common a common critique, and, and you're an energy expert, so so <laughs> you have you have, you might have something unique to say about this. Uh, but but isn't it true that that's actually not that big of a deal because we only train it once in a way, or maybe not once, but relatively infrequently. Well, th- but that's the thing. I mean, uh, Dewey, because I, I, you know, when you read between the lines and some of the Chat GPT stuff, like you say, there's a, there's an intervention, there's kind of continual intervention being done in there, and it looks like there, there's a there's a sort of a there's a maintenance aspect to it. So they must be doing something in terms of kind of keeping up to date. And I think, I mean, my my, I was taking it to the extreme where effectively I'm thinking. You know, if if someone were to leave it on and it just started generating data, and you come back in a hundred years' time, and and you know you've got this sort of the, the the sum total of human knowledge on a bunch of hard drives, and this much of it was created by actual humans, and then 
this much of it was just generated by some browser tab that someone left open on chat GPT, you know, that that's, I, I think that that's a, that's a, an extreme example, but I think it's, it's, it's possible. Cause like you say, who's going to consume this content? Because if, if it were to start getting to the point where you have lots of these kind of bots or, or large language models sitting around the internet somewhere, and they can be communicated with by other things, if they start talking to each other and you start getting this feedback loop of content generation, it could very quickly spin very uh, out of control, you know, and you start getting into the situation where, um, you know, people are moaning about like cryptocurrencies taking a huge amount of energy and, and they do, I mean, they do take, some of them do take a lot of energy, but, um, you know, nothing compared to like you know, farming or, or, you know, the energy industry, for example. But but if, if these things start generating just content for people who consume content and then they generate content, that, that becomes a, a bit of an issue. But it's also, the content is also just, I mean, it's got to be repetitive, right? Because it's not learning anything new. It's, uh, or it might be, but compared to what it can put out, it, you know, the new things that it learns, if it's human generated, humans can't keep up with it, right? They can't teach it new things at the same pace as it can keep, you know, parenting, pa parenting essentially old knowledge, because what it really is is a, it's a type of parrot, right? So if it says, if you if you ask it to tell you a story about you know a lovely day in London, let's say, you know, it'll say the sky was blue, and so on, right? But it won't know. Like it doesn't have any experience of a blue sky. It won't even know why the sky is blue. Is a phrase that humans like, right? You know, it knows that humans like to say that when they talk about a nice day. Because that's frequently what they talk about, <laughs> but that's all really it does, right? It's it's based on these frequencies. Probably, although you're with London, you're more likely to get it to say that the sky was gray. So yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you predicate it with a lovely, a bunch of Yelp reviews. <laughs> yeah, so, someone uploads a bunch of Yelp reviews and it's like, oh, miserable. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but, but it, one one yeah. of the things I well. One of the things I keep trying, I, I've been looking for, I've been trying to sort of like keep an eye on, like if there's a big scientific discovery, like, a, you know, something with the James Webb telescope or something, sees something or finds some new image or new thing, I'm going to kind of try and keep hitting like chat GPT and ask it the question about it to see when does it get updated? Like, when is it able yeah. to go and get that information and bring it in? So if I keep sort of saying like, you know, when... If we find a new planet or something like that, I'd be like, right, where's the latest planet? And then just see if it, see when it updates, you know, I think yeah, that, kind yeah. of keep testing it, you know? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, that's a just good strategy. Yeah, I think uh, in general, um, do you, do you want to tell us a bit about what you, what you found in your uh, playing around with it? Because um, we, we had an offline conversation earlier where you showed me a few things. Maybe it would be great to, to let the, the <laughs> sure, yeah. viewers in on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me let me get that. Um, so I found it to be really quite uh, useful for. Let me share. Uh, so I think this is the thing that, that I find it quite kind of useful for is the you know this is the, this is probably what where it probably started. So it finds it really easy to generate code. So you can say, you know, um, uh, you know. Write a write a, uh, uh, method to slice. Uh, by write a method to slice. Oh, this is for pandas data set work. Yeah, yeah, In... yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, this is a good example. So, so for the listeners, he just typed in uh, write write a method to slice a pandas data frame by named column in Python. Okay, great. So and it spits yeah. out um, code. Yeah. And very nice. I like the formatting yeah. of it. It has a background, you know, black background. So it looks exactly as it would in a in, in various um, uh, how do you call them I, I, IDEs, I suppose. Yeah. And the, the beauty of this is as well is that it actually, um, you know, it follows kind of Python esque um protocol so so it says you know it uses the sort of df as data frame and pd for pandas and all the kind of 
things that you're working with and, and it uses underscores for your variable names and stuff like that so it kind of it works really nicely and it gives you examples which is actually that's really cool i, I i've done uh, i did another one uh earlier and I th this is all we were talking about where it created a a function to do that and basically spat out the function for me and this is really useful because that as a as a you know software developer and some of the managers software developers, it, I like the fact that it's commented and it's got the arguments and it's got the return functions and it, it follows a follows a, a, a methodology which is is awesome because if everyone wrote like this it, it would be so much easier life would be so much easier to to fix bugs you know so that's the kind of that's one of these things that's really useful and um, the the other one that I did uh, as an example was. Um, I, I wrote. I asked it a question. If it takes an orchestra with twenty people in it three minutes to play a concerto, how long will it take an orchestra of thirty people to play the same tune? Um, and it it did a very programmatic thing. It went away and it, it saw numbers, and it's obviously gone and and done a sum with those numbers. So it said basically, it's come up saying, assuming all the factors are the same, the tempo and all this kind of stuff. So it's prefaced its answer. Uh, and it basically says, right, well, it takes 20 people three minutes. So how long will it take 30 people? So it goes away and it does the maths correctly based on what it's assumed, obviously. And it says now that it takes four and a half minutes for 30 people to play that same tune. Oh, so that's weird. Okay. <laughs> that's a really weird answer because, <laughs> uh, because it could have also made it shorter, right? If you, if you ask it, uh, uh, if, if, if we were to say, you know, um, how long will it take um, 20 bricklayers to build a wall, um, how long will it take 30 bricklayers to build the same wall? It should be less time, right? Not more time. <laughs> but then, yeah, the orchestra, that's a really funny example. <laughs> that's a very funny example. So it, it, it didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, this, I, this I actually, thought I was actually yeah, being quite generous. No, no, yeah. I was going to say, I thought I was actually being quite generous because I, I've kind of said, you know, this is, it's, a, it's an orchestra playing a, a concerto or a tune. I, I, I thought uh, I was hoping in, you know, deep in my soul to, uh, for that it would get it right and be <laughs> like, well, I would recognize that orchestras play songs. Songs have fixed lengths. Yeah. You know, that I, I, when it actually, so when I, when I saw it kind of spitting out, you know, assuming all the other factors remain constant, like the tempo and the skill level of the musicians, I, I, I was hoping that it was about to tell me, it would be the same amount of time, but no. <laughs> yes, of course, of course, of course. But that, that was, yeah. That was proven well. But this this demonstrates a point that Noam Chomsky is making in a way, right? In a in a visceral way, which is um, uh, that that basically we will not learn much about how our brain operates on language or how language works in the human context from such machines because these machines don't really understand the meaning. Right? It, they understand semantics in some ways, because, so, so it's interesting, you know, semantics, I guess, is the study of meaning in language. And so it understands it in the way that, it, yeah, in a way that, that you would if, if, if all that language were, were a sequence of words. So, so in, 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 in they can, that can refer to each other. So it understands this reference to each other. It understands that blue is an adjective for the sky, but it doesn't understand the meaning of it because it's obviously never been walking around outside and it never saw the sky. It doesn't have any real reference to it. It only has it in as far as language does. So it lives entirely in a world of language and that's not what humans do and that's not the point of language. The point of language is to signify yeah, exactly. something. Yeah. In the, in the yeah. lived oh, so, so, so so, so what I did, so what I did after, I, I, you know, I, I kind of had a bit of a failure in that that sense. I, I went to, I, I was looking at the kind of scientific paper aspects of it because I've seen a lot of chat about, you know, the science thing, and and I, it comes back to this language thing, like understanding language, because the 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 real thing with language is the nuance and kind of how someone says things, inflection and all this kind of stuff. And I was trying to think, okay, how can I look at how well it interprets text. So I, I put a, a, the, the abstract to one, a paper I wrote years and years and years ago when I was doing my, my postgraduate. And, and I asked it to summarize the, the, the text for me. And, and it actually, it did, it did pretty well. 
it does actually rearrange my text or my abstract into some, you know, some usable sense. I could kind of use it to, um, I could use this to explain the paper to say someone who was, you know, interested in knowing what I wrote, but it, it missed the, the, the nuance of, of everything. It kind of missed the point of the paper. So very often when you write an abstract, you can't say what you want to say because you don't necessarily have rock solid proof for it. But what you're doing, what I was doing in that particular paper was I was actually sort of saying, look, we we made a crystal that sort of showed a certain structure exists. It could be the reason why these drugs don't really work that well in this circumstance. And that's what we're trying to infer from the paper. Um, but obviously that the, the chat GPT has no idea that that is what I'm trying to say, you know, because it, it doesn't know which, which, you know, journal I published it in and why we did it and what the articles around it were and, you know, what the context was. So it really missed, it, it, it summarized elegantly what was written there, but it missed all the nuance. And, and that's, that's one of the tricks. And one of the things that we find as well, I mean, scientific papers can be quite misleading in some cases, certainly in the energy industry. And I find in, in industries where there's a lot of money involved because there's an impetus to kind of patent things and keep things a little bit on the DL. So you, you, people can't really reproduce what you're doing. You know, um, in the data science world, you don't see it much because there's an open source nature to it. But certainly in some of the more kind of, you know, more higher um, revenue industries, you see things where there's, I'm not going to say dishonesty, but there's like a certain amount of, of like keeping things out of some of the papers that they publish because they want the credit. You know, there's a grad student who is saying, right, I want to have my name on this paper or I don't get my PhD or I, my postdoc funding is poor, but I don't publish these things. But they don't want to let it all out there because that's that's where they're going to try and maybe spin off into a little company of their own. So you see things like maybe, you know, incorrect formulas or maybe some hidden steps in some algorithms that are not written about in a, in a paper. So if you give one of these papers to ChatGPT, it will just, you know, at like rote learn what's in that paper and spit it out to you perfectly correctly. But it probably won't understand that there's bits missing until you actually try and implement what you see in that paper. You won't understand that there's bits missing. So it kind of comes down to the sort of, it's about the actor. It's about the person who's kind of putting this stuff into the the um, the, the algorithm or the, the the model. You know, the person who's trying to do it, and also what they're feeding it. So, you know, I, that prompt for me was my abstract. If I feed it another paper, it's going to give me a scientific paper, you know, summary. But it might not necessarily be what I need to know from that paper, which is that that's interesting yeah. to me as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So I mean, when when, when it jumps. Yeah, yeah, Noam Chomsky. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go on. Well, I'm just going to say, cause so when you come back to Noam Chomsky's thing about about language and you know how you learn, it, it's 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 kind of the proof part because effectively, when we we know if we what we take what we know about language and we put it, we implement it in one of these models, that kind of proves that we were right, but it, it didn't help us work out how to get there, you know. Um, and I think, yeah. you know, it's like. Uh, if if we try to get it to make like a jazz song, you know, a jazz musician is going to go on about how, you know, they're, they're missing different notes and they're making up different notes as they go along and maybe they're, you know, miss different beats. And, and you know, it's the, you hear that thing where they say you have to listen to what they're not playing as well as what they are playing. And, yes. I, and I wonder how long Famous. it's going to take us to get to that level with these these models, you know? Yeah, I mean, is it possible with a large language model of any sort? to to get to that point i mean that's also questionable in some ways right if it's even possible and, and so that that all leads to the question so we can't learn how language works from them that's noam chomsky's main point i think i think his other point is that maybe that one is not quite as good and, and that is that you know it's just basically high-tech plagiarism at this point which is partially correct right so it, it, the 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 chat gpt will when 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 you ask it to write something it will write um it will it will contain ideas that are taken from somewhere right yeah. on some for some of the text that it was trained yeah. on but it will not attribute it mm -hmm. to to those things so that that's another issue 
um, that potentially could be fixed, right? So they're talking about fixing that part. So I think that's possible. To yeah, fix. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. They're basically just referencing what what is used to give you that. Yeah. 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 yeah I exactly. If it does. I, agree. I mean, I know that they have a. Yeah, but I was going to say, I wonder if they already if it already does because I know that there's actually quite a lot more output than what it gives you if you if you access it like programmatically, it gives you like a lot more dense information than it's kind of just its answer. It gives you kind of machine understandable information. So maybe, maybe it already does give you referencing and, and just not mm -hmm. showing it. But yeah, that, that's, that's but possible. I mean, that, you you, you can ask. We do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, in a sense, yeah. But, but that's yeah, why but that's when, we, we do when we, yeah, Oops. it is. Sorry. But, <laughs> but when we, when we, when we do it in the college course, we are taught that we have to properly yeah. cite a ref. You know, we have to properly uh, cite our, um, uh, our our sources and so on, right? And and this is part of university writing. Right? This is what you do. You have to cite your sources. And interestingly, this thing does not cite its sources, which you would think. You know, I guess all of the people who have worked on it, they they were went through college at some point, and they were probably taught to cite properly cite their reference uh, their their sources. And yet they didn't teach it to do that. So it's kind of actually interesting in it, in and of itself. But then, so suppose, you know, suppose we can fix that, right? So that, that doesn't seem to be an impossible hurdle. We could, you know, I can, I, I've tried to play around with it and I ask it, you know, so where do you know this from? What, what, who wrote, wrote it or whatever? And, and it told me the references. Sometimes it makes up references, <laughs> which is completely weird and, and ridiculous, right? So it makes up names and say, well, so and so and all, it, it all wrote this. And, and then you look for them and you can't find them and you wonder, you know, who are these people? Uh, it, it just made them up uh, out of whole cloth, really interestingly. Um, <laughs> fascinatingly, I don't know why it would, yeah. Well, I guess it, that, that is that big, large language model part of it, right? So it predicts patterns. And so one pattern would be a citation. So it then creates one and makes one up and names kind of sound similar. So here's a name for you. So it makes up a name. It's, 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 a, it's quite, I mean, I guess that's what you would predict from a large language model in a way. But then suppose we fix all of this and we get correct references and we have all of that sort of behavior. The next question would be, so what is this good for, right? So what can it really do that adds something? I mean, aside from producing, so I can understand how it's good for a college student who needs to write a paper and wants to do it quickly. I can understand that, but that's sort of aside the point, right? Because that's not why you're writing the paper. You're writing the paper to learn something. And so here you're, as, as Noam Chomsky pointed out as well, uh, you know, you're, you're now um, using this tool to avoid learning, <laughs> right? And, and you would do that if, if, you know, if the subject is boring and you're not really interested, okay, I can see the point. But if you're interested in the subject, why would you use it, right? So, so there's that. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly that sort of question. What is it good for? What can it be used for that is, that is a genuine application? Um, can you make money with it? So that's, that's a question I think a lot of people would be interested in. Uh, you know, what, what kind of businesses could you see coming that uh, could be built on top of it? Is it? That's, that's one question I have actually. So, so what, what kind of businesses could you see going forward that we could build on chat GPT? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, in terms of the businesses, uh, I, you know, the, unfortunately I think the, the ones that will, the ones that will be able to answer that will make a business and become very very rich far more wealthy than me um but uh you know if, if i could think of a good one i think in in general terms it's probably ones that are very kind of like person facing i mean if you you could maybe get it to make up a bunch of t-shirt slogans and then start you know just get a factory somewhere to make you all these t-shirts and then say right these are all chat gpt t-shirts and then being the first one to do that will probably make you the wealthiest person doing it you know so a whole bunch of things like you know make cute things about uh you know my dog and sell on etsy you know that kind of stuff i think that that there's probably there's probably small industries around that level 
And I've I've got some cute books for my kids where they you tell them your tell them your name their name you tell them some a couple of like handful of little things that they like like do they like to swim reading writing running jumping and they'll print you like a little book a little story book about your kid you could make a far more dense version of that with ChatGPT you could get it to write a proper novella you know so but these things already exist you know that that's already happening people are already making t-shirts and selling you know cute things that are personalized stuff like that i i i you know i think um i think the most useful things i've seen from this are, are again already being used the, the kind of the code thing i think academia has to really shift itself into being able to to cope with it and like you say if if you've just got a whole bunch of students that are just not engaged in your courses and they're literally just trying to get through to the end of it, it's just spit me out an essay on this topic. Um, you know, I, I think if, you, if they get unlucky and it prints out an essay that's just gibberish and they get a really low score, then they'll get caught, obviously, right? But if they get, if they hit this sort of mark well enough, if that person says, hit, write me a C plus essay in this topic, so they kind of just go under the radar, then that, that's quite, that would be quite, quite interesting as a, as a, as a way forward. I, but I think, um, um, what we've, so one of the things that's interesting from my point of view is, is we try and make, um, things like expert systems. So we try and impart knowledge into systems. Um, and that's really tricky because, how do you do that? How do I how do I um, take someone who has been working in a particular area or a particular field of, of knowledge for say thirty or forty years, and how do I take their intrinsic little pieces of knowledge? They know okay that's happening, so if we change that over there, it's going to correct it. You know, there's in these large kind of complex integrated systems that it takes a long time for someone to get that kind of of knowledge in, ingrained in them. How do I take that and then impart that into some kind of system? And I think chat GPT's learning algorithm is the thing that's of interest to me in that sense, because I need to be able to kind of turn it somehow into a process behind the scenes that I can then trigger when I see things like that happening. So it's, I think um, I, I'm not necessarily as interested in some of the outputs that come out of the chat GPT, but definitely the methodology and, and how it how it it consumes extra information and prompts. That that's something that I think will be useful going ahead. You know. So so then the the next question I I also had is so we we were talking a little bit offline about um, Galactica, which is um, uh, a related large network uh, large. Um, uh, large language model that was based precisely or was built precisely to um, to to write scientific papers or to help in that process. Maybe not to write the entire paper, but to help you, for example, write the um, write write the citation part or the, what is it called, the literature review, uh, for example, or or give me all of the the things that I should cite uh, on on some particular topic. Right. So this is was put out by Meta. Um, this is um, you know, and and it was live for about three days uh, to try out for for people to try out. Sort of similarly to to what ChatGPT is now, you can go and try it out for free. It's completely free. You can interact with it. Similarly, that was also the case there. But after three days, it was taken down because of a, a barrage of tweets and complaints. And yeah, let's talk about that. What what what? How do you how do you see that fit into the to the whole ecosystem of AI? systems yeah so i th that's that's really that was really interesting i, I kind of watched that unfold and thought wow because <laughs> at the same time it, it it sparked a lot of the discussion that i think people kind of are in, a lot of the media and, and a lot of people are enjoying in terms of the fear mongering because you know when it started to kind of say things that were outrageous or, or just you know it was being prompted to to do things that and became more and more of a catastrophe. It, a lot of people were were kind of pointing their finger and wagging and being like, look, see, this will destroy us all, you know. And it's like, well, no, it's just not been given the correct boundary, right? It's just not been provided the steer that is 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 done. And it, it kind of it, it brought back it brings back memories of of just like 
you know, when, when I create software and people use it, I, I'm sort of building software and I try and test it as much as possible. And we get, you know, we have a whole raft of different, you know, QCs and QAs that we go through. But then inevitably when it gets on someone's desk and they start spitting numbers into it, it's things that we never even thought about and stuff happens. And you're like, wow. First of all, I, how, why are you typing that into my software? Because that's not right. But then when it starts going wrong, you start thinking, okay, okay, should I should I handle that? Should I really should I be writing my software to be able to to cope with this nonsense? <laughs> you know. So it's kind of one of these things. Like who who bears responsibility for it? Because if you were to start start getting Galactica to you know just spit out information about these things and it starts saying this incredible stuff and you're like wow why did you ask <laughs> well well no but but that's that's very interesting so, so some of the things that were asked weren't that extreme right so there is um, um one of the the researchers yeah. uh, from from the um i think he was from the um max planck institute asked it questions that and this was um hold on this his name is I can I can dig this out here real quick. Michael Black, from uh, who is I think the director or high high up uh, person at the Max Planck Institute, asked a question about things that he actually knows a lot about. Yeah. You know, yeah. So so technical questions. And it just it just lied. It yeah. Just, so the yeah. thing is, it it sounds, but the, the dangerous part of it, I think, that the the big critique of it was that it sounds very authoritar uh, authoritative, and it in fact. Uh, looks mm -hmm. for anyone who doesn't know about the topic, it looks like it could be accurate, right? It looks reasonable. So it doesn't sound so crazy. So wh when you ask it about the history of bears in space, which they did, that's when you know it's unreasonable because we all know that there are no bears in space. But when it comes to topics that that are possible, where there is some plausibility and that we don't understand, that most of us don't yeah. understand, but some expert does understand and they can say and they can ask this questions and they can see that it's wrong that it's made yeah. up but still authoritative sounding and potentially plausible that's when i think people got really freaked out yeah but i think actually so so don't you think here's a, a question that maybe like most people don't ask uh, but don't you think that it's actually a, a good thing right so so when people say oh see here here we go right this is the end of the world and this is you know and and and, and it showed us how it you know how it's going to create all this miserable but uh, m misery but but shouldn't we be really happy to see that it was taken down after three days so so this is my you know what what i take away from it is, yeah. yeah it was taken down it was shut down despite of um mm -hmm. uh, you know jan lacan lacan didn't want to take it down right he was uh, he actually tweeted are you happy now we shut it down yeah. are you happy now and uh, he was defending it all the way <laughs> to the end uh, but but actually we should be happy because it was corrected for it was taken down and now yeah. presumably it will be improved before it is let out again yeah I, and I'm, I'm sure that they they will have you know they will have garnered a huge amount of really valuable data from even the three days that it was up you know people were using it like i say it, it will have had to deal with stuff that it, it would never have expected or we could never have been trained for and that that will be really useful information and yeah it, it's an example of a company acting really responsibly and, and taking it down and they still stand by it i mean i saw a post the other day about um one of the the meta guys uh, and he was they were still stand by it and saying like look you know you know it, it we got to take it down but you know it, it was i believe in this technology and stuff like that that was kind of the gist of what he was posting so it's you know they're still obviously working on it in the background and and, and that's good yeah uh, i mean it's kind of it's like a it's like a maybe noam chomsky will be very happy that you know effectively it looks like these these large language models have a sort of dunning kruger effect of their own you know they'll they just they'll just say things that they don't really know anything about, and and they'll 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 come up. It'll be yeah. it'll be up to us to figure out whether they're. Yeah, but I think that yeah, his criticism stands, but at the same time, it stands for now, right? But then at the same time, maybe it stands forever because oh, when it comes to language, more, uh, really understanding language, it it can understand languages that can't possibly exist. So that's a, this is part of his criticism, right? So. We can make up a language that goes against any rules of human language, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, it is an impossible human language that can't possibly exist in this human world. 
And it will just do the same thing as it does with real language and it won't make any difference. It won't notice any difference from, from the perspective of the large language model. It's basically the same. And so that's that's a that's something that we will not get over. So so for sure, but but you could say that maybe the point of it isn't to teach us about language, right? So you can say, okay, for sure, we cannot learn how human languages work from it, but that might not be its point, right? So we can still make cute t-shirts and make lots of money. And we can still uh, maybe use it for marketing purposes, which I think would be probably the biggest one, right? So marketing, uh, unfortunately, has always been um, not very high quality writing, in my in my opinion. And right? it's it's hyperbolic, it's trite, it usually uses metaphors that are highly overused. It, it, you know, the, the, there seems to be no problem with that for people. They seem to still buy it, even if it, you, uh, you know, for me, it, it tends to, when I, when I read things that are of that nature, you know, trite things that are kind of overused metaphors or even wrongly used metaphors, you know, not quite, not quite the right thing. So I ask it, for example, what are, you know, can you write me, a hook for a chapter on uh, on on algorithms. What are algorithms, right? I just wanted to try it out, and it gave me back that algorithms are the tireless workers, that are, are the unsung heroes. Uh, you know the, the, that sort of language. <laughs> and of course, they're not unsung. unsung heroes, but, you know, yes, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. absurd because we're talking about algorithms all the time. How are they unsung heroes? But but you know the, the, this language yeah. is just something that works well for marketing, right? It seems to work well for marketing at the moment. So yeah. maybe for marketing, yeah. it, it's a good use case. Why not? Right. So yeah, so that I mean, when they if they if they want to try and go for something like volume rather than like quality, that that this kind of thing is is definitely the uh, the, the case. I, I mean, like if you're a copywriter who is just trying to kind of create, you know, little sna snippets of text to go underneath images, mm -hmm. then that that's that's going to save your or probably going to take your job yeah so that might be the the the, the what it's sort of most used for i mean like marketing and and uh, it's such a huge generates such a huge amount of money for so many companies around the world i think people probably would be you know very surprised mm -hmm. when you look at the the budget that companies like coca-cola and, and microsoft spend on on simply just marketing their their products that's that's a huge sector um, and i mean i would be worried about how that how that evolves. If you look at, um, you know, people talk a lot about the sort of Facebook algorithms and the YouTube algorithms yeah. and kind of putting videos in front of people that are going to rile them up and mm -hmm. be, uh, you know, just, just enough to kind of get someone worried or make someone anxious and just kind of put videos and content in front of people that is not healthy for them, but it will trigger a response. And those responses are geared towards keeping you on the platform or making you yes. engage or write the comment and get angry and, you know, exactly. wind you up. If you couple those algorithms, with something like chat GPT that is able to just generate that stuff. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a potential issue that, that really could be a yeah, problem. so psychometrics, basically, if you learn how to push the right buttons on the people to get them engaged and keep buying and, and so yeah. on, and then you, yeah, you, you, you combine that with a language model, which then yeah. uses language, maybe you also combine it with a deep fake on top of that, <laughs> you can, yeah. I don't know. It, it is it's yeah. a scary world. Well, it's a... I mean, you could be there. I mean, you can get, you can get pretty malicious, you know. I mean, that's one of the things with um, with uh, with Twitter, where they're talking about maybe trying to get rid of the bots, or at least they're telling people they're trying to get rid of all the bots. You know, you get you do get these bot responses where you're sort of, you know, if if you if you say something uh, about a company or and that the company will respond, but that's not a person responding. It's a little bot that's triggered to write you a little message based on seeing negative feedback about the company on, on Twitter. Absolutely. And, you know, you could get pretty complicated content generated. You could almost have a billion arguments started with every, every Twitter user <laughs> just by chat GPT, just tell it to tell it to annoy everyone on Twitter. <laughs> and, and watch it go. So, well, well, no, let's 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 stick with this for a second more. Uh, so, 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 actually, when we're talking about yeah, this kind of thing, then what the next step is when when you when you realize that, right? So, as a human being, once once a lot of people realize, for example, that Facebook is causing harm 
uh, to young teenage girls, for example, and other things, and, and destroys democracies and so on. Once people learn that, it turns out that, that Facebook is now you losing a lot of users, right? So now if you take that logic um, to, to the next level, you, you might, the, the risk might actually be that the internet itself becomes completely useless, right? So if, if, if I think that the internet is a source of information, if I want to inform myself, I go to the internet. That's what I currently do. And I think that, um, that uh, you know, that's what the internet was built for. In fact, right. So, for informational purposes, you you go and, and and maybe there are some reputable sources that it can still make sense, right? So you can say, forget about most of the internet, but the reputable sources are still good. But now, if you can fake that, if you can fake being from the rep reputable source, suddenly maybe the whole internet stands to not be useful. Then you know, lose its use value, its its original use value of being a source of information. Do, do you worry about that? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, th that's one of the things that a lot of people are, are are very concerned about, and rightly so. I mean, I think that that this starts to then look into the discussion about like Web three, um, and and trying to sort of democratize it. Because then, if you can democratize a system like that, then you can try and mitigate as much of a bad actor as possible. Where you sort of say, right, we're all trying to build a system where it's in there, but. The difficulty is that if you have something that can generate this kind of content, there's nothing saying that yeah. you can't create a whole bunch of articles and create a couple of deep fake images or videos, and then you know maybe spit some information into Wikipedia, and all of a sudden you've invented some kind of of thing. Yeah, well, and, and you know that, that you didn't doesn't didn't actually exist, but you cause a lot yeah, of problems. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And then then you know this also speaks to an episode, so a previous episode, I should say, um, where we were talking about the democratization of, um, of AI. And in that episode, Dorothea Bauer explained to me that, you know, actually the problem with democratization is that it cuts out experts. So, so experts are in a way today, the, the, the gatekeepers of a way of, of reputable, of good sources of knowledge, right? So we go to the experts to find the good knowledge. Now, if we democratize things, it might become even worse because it's it becomes much more populist and everything is, is on an equal footing, including utter garbage, right? And so now we can produce garbage really in large quantities. <laughs> then we add democratization. I'm worried that it gets actually worse than that, that that, that, that will make it worse, depending on how we do the democratization. Well, that's so, so I mean, well, that's the thing. I, I've certainly seen, I, I have seen something like that happen in, 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 in the industry that I'm in. So for example, the, the way that we avoid that in an, from an academic point of view is, is you have a, you have an impact factor for your, the journals that you're publishing in. And typically you will trust the impact factor, jur the journals with impact factors that are highest. And, and the idea is that you create a kind of a, a, a relationship between the kind of the content that these people are producing and the, the peer review process that they go through and how rigorous they assess the research that they're publishing. And that gives you some level of confidence in what you're, you're seeing. When you look at, you know, a journal, um, like, a you can look at some of the German chemical journals and be like, right, I know that, that the people that published this paper went through hell to get it into this journal because there will have been several questions and it will be a, a process of writing it and, and it'll be really rigorously researched. But and you can look at some, you know, some of the sort of magazine oh, yeah. puff pieces that are, and be like, right, I'm not going to trust that. But then, you know, so you can but there are some industries where there are bodies that publish kind of they, what they call scientific research, but there's no peer review process. In, in any of their journals and you can you basically you see just the regurgitation of ideas that have already been out there for the sake of people kind of getting a chartership and it becomes really really quite quite soul destroying sometimes because you're looking at this stuff thinking god there's absolutely no rigor in any of this and um, so but you can see that it's, it's already happening in certain industries i mean the ones that that are most rigorous tend to be the ones that make the least money, unfortunately. Um, so because they they have to kind of maintain a certain level of um, 
a level of rigor to maintain a level of respect. And whereas the ones that are just sort of spitting out content in terms of scientific papers are just the ones that, you know, they're just doing it because it, it, you know, it gets their name out there and they can put it on their CVs, you know? So it, typically, you know, so the problem yeah. then becomes how do we vet that? How do we make sure that, you know, I don't open the doors and let these large language models like just generate their own peer reviewing and their own, their own content that, that gets that tricks the user into thinking this is rigorous scientific information well, yeah. you know. it's true like you and i you know we we might carefully evaluate the sources of what we read i do and you do clearly but you know many many people have this and, and there is this you know phenomenon that we know it's called um uh what is it called confirmation bias Right. So if we have confirmation bias and we're not that rigorous right. and we just want to, you know, hear what we really want to hear anyway, and you know, this this involves voting, right? So now, so so if it if, if it has any impact on democracy, in, in other words, then we are victims of it. Even if we even if we you know vet our information carefully and we look at the sources and we know what is reputable and what is not reputable and so on not every one of our compatriots does that. And so then we end up, you know, actually a large number may not. And then we end up with, how to say, gangsters taking over our political houses, <laughs> you know, then and, and, and aided aided by chat GPT and deep fakes and so on. This, this is something that I'm worried about, that, that we, we are getting actually worse in this direction. And we're allowing ourselves to make more psychologically enticing pieces that are basically fake news because we can actually use very rigorous very peer-reviewed methods <laughs> to to fool people right so because yeah we, we, we go to the, the you know they, they go to the journals of of uh, the, the very well peer-reviewed journals of psychometrics and uh, and and find out what will make a you know make us tick and then give us what yeah. we want right what's going to What's going to trigger people to vote for me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is a yeah. that's something. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely, definitely. It's it's got. Uh, I mean, I I then wonder how you know you you get, um, you know you you've got people that generate computer viruses and you know maybe make money out of selling the 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 cure for the computer virus and stuff like that. But you also have this kind of this trope of the, the ethical hacker where. You know, you'll get people who are genuinely ethically out there to sort of help people, and and you know, and I think, um, you know, do we have, uh, we have, we must have the ethical data scientist, and at the same time, who is maybe looking for ways to recognize that kind of content. You know, I mean, it, it, these are numerical algorithms, and all numerical al algorithms have signatures of some sort. You know, the right down towards the way they converge and the way that they they generate information. So. Is there a way for me to differentiate a deep faked image from a real image based on understanding where they where they come from? You know, if if they're coming from something like a like a generative um, adversarial network, you know, there's the discriminator and the um, the actor. And do, is there a way of us amping up the discriminator a little bit to try and say, okay? It, this this image is it real or not? I mean, well, whenever I wonder we if do there's that, a, whenever, there's a, there's a, yeah, whenever uh, we do that somebody will find a way to up the generator there's an arms right? race so so we're, then basically what we're doing is we're taking this yeah. little arms race that's going on inside of the model and we're making it more global right so now we're having a better generator we have a better discriminator and we're going to end up in this kind of tug of war forever right? i cannot <laughs> see actually any way out of that unfortunately I wish yeah I could. I, yeah i mean unfortunately i fear, I fear that's probably where we're going <laughs> Yeah, uh, like arms races, which then ultimately yeah, make yeah, the it's really worrying. Oh. Yeah, and then and, well, so so my my interest is then you know I I don't know much about this yet about solid. Uh, I would like to learn more about it. I, it seems to me it, it's right now a little bit of a block a black box, but the the future of the internet might be somewhere in that because uh, you know Sir Berners Lee is someone I have a lot of respect for and. He's, uh, he's been developing this concept of solid, which I know a little bit about it, just enough to, to know, you know semantic networks. It's based on semantic networks and, uh, and, and each node, right? So you're, you, you have information about yourself. You should govern it, right? So you should, be, you should be the owner of this node, of this informational node that represents Alan Tomini. And I should be you know, responsible for Johannes Kastner's node. And then 
what what happens is uh, you know there are linkages that are negotiated in between, right? So maybe you and I work together, and then we can say we're colleagues, right? and then we have that link that's negotiated that is accepted by both of us, right? And so we can we can do it that way, and and maybe that will be the future, and who knows, you know, where where that is going. I I have some hope in that. Uh, that's kind of where I I see some hope. But with this ChatGPT, I mean that's just data, right? So that that is not really. It, it, I don't know how that interacts with how the internet is structured. Actually, that's that's a very complicated question. But so, how do you use it? Do you use any large uh, language model? I've been using it to uh, honestly not not in in any kind of production sense. Uh, I've been using it to generate um, some you know in, in interesting kind of little pieces of code i've used it to try and like help me build some like little dashboards and stuff because I, I don't know much html so it's quite useful for that you know it's kind of like make it make a little section of uh so i've been using it for that one of the things i've been actually quite interested in is is like um it trying to get it to so i'm doing like a a, a separate course on on brewing and distilling um, and I've been trying to get it to to spit out like okay, give me a maybe not not a recipe for for like a the perfect lager or something like that. Like try and get me the characteristics of the best IPA, you know, and see what it says. And and I've just been sort of thinking to myself, okay, can I can I take that and maybe see if I can make that into a recipe? Because that that kind of um, I think that really intrigues me. That's like the like. You know, brewing and distilling is some of the oldest things that you know human society has been doing, um, right the way back to the earliest remains of, of you know people. And you know, coupling it with something like ChatGPT, it's like the sort of cutting edge of, of knowledge, that'd be really quite cool to, to bring those two together. So I've been trying to see if it will come up with anything sensible. Um, it's been quite generic in its responses. Yeah. Apart from that, I think um, I've been trying to um, you know look at building a few kind of like course examples, trying to sort of make it um, make it help me. I think I think you you mentioned that you were doing something very similar to it. make it make it write a couple of like interesting questions, um, in, interesting problems to solve as well to try and kind of create a little bit of, uh, of <clears throat> useful information. But also quite like I've been using it as a as sort of generative uh, sense, so like you can make it kind of spit out lots and lots of like like names and dates and ages and stuff mm -hmm. like that so i've been using that in some of my um some of my work and research to, to try and get it to just to, to sort of spit out information for me that, that i can then use as like sample mm -hmm. data and um, so just just literally just to generate content which is you know i think i i feel like that's kind of what it's going to be used Interesting. Most. so so are you worried at all that it might um it might give you names that are made up or that are that belong to people that are not relevant to what you're asking it that you have to check it so yeah so so that's actually yeah that's one of the things that's kind of kind of concerning there was a little bit of a you know this gdpr is pretty stringent regulations here in europe and i, I think one of the things that would be worrying me is if it was to come up with like a like a john smith 52 you know with an address and there is actually a person you know just purely because that's such a common name and you know i think that would worry me that it would it would do that so um i think i've been trying to just um uh trying to get it to be I, i'm just using a lot of this stuff for just like testing purposes and, and offline stuff and I, I, I'd, I'd be very very hesitant of using it in like production kind of uh level code or production level stuff it really would be very hesitant about that so i'm kind of treating it at like arm's length with with some of that stuff it's it's got to be quite uh i'd have to be quite convinced that it wasn't you know going to get me in trouble before i <laughs> used any of it certainly so um but again that, that kind of comes back to you know there's um uh, like the ethics of it you have to i have to even though i know it's been made up i think then i have to sort of cite like i got this data from here and and you know somehow record the fact that i've got this data from here i think uh, and be very open about it obviously that you say like this is this came from chat gpt and and or you know gpt3 generated this data you know i think that i would hope that that would kind of cover you on most bases but you know who knows yeah <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. So then, uh, one one thing that's maybe completely different. Uh, well, not completely different, but it's it's related. But you know, another question that I had and this related to what um, Gary Marcus was writing about in terms of uh, Noam Chomsky's. You know, he's he's riffing on on Noam Chomsky's critique, and that has to do with um, this idea that John John Locke had. Um, that is that we that the way that we learn, right? I think that we can put a, you know this argument actually to rest once and for all, and that is this idea that we have a blank slate at birth, and that actually what we do is we are learning everything in the statistical way, right? So we're we're taking in information and everything that we know, all of our language and everything. But interestingly, language grammar seems to work with very little architecture right so i mean i guess the, the neural network actually has architecture right? so it's, it's not a blank slate from the very beginning it is not but you could say that that it is as blank slate like as anything will ever be and you can see that what happens the the shortcomings of it are directly related in some way to this fact that we're not a blank slate right so we're born with for example, it seems, you know, this is also, Noam Chom- I mean, it goes way back to, to Noam Chomsky's arguments about le- universal grammar, the fact that we always have a certain structure to our language, a subject and an object and some kind of verb. And, and, and that basically, in some ways, we're proving this, right, that, that a blank slate is impossible, uh, that, that, you know, that a lot of it, of our architecture, of our brain or of our, of our cognitive apparatus, has to be there at birth that has to be there from the beginning is, isn't that right isn't that what you could actually in some way say G- chat gpt and large language models in general are teaching us this yeah i i think so i mean i i don't know how i think you have to qualify this sort of blank slate idea i mean because if you've got a large language model or like a deep learning model that that has it will have a structure. People will have implemented a certain structure. You know, if you have, if you go back to some of the, uh, like the inception neural network thing that we talked about earlier, that has like a structure. It has convolutional layers, and then it's got drop, drops things. That is the structure. It might be, you know, it might the 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 actual coefficients in the 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 layers in the model might have started as a blank slate but there is a structure to it in the same way i mean our brains will have a structure you know we'll have people who are born people who are born to exceptionally talented athletes and have children who become exceptionally talented athletes there's 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 a nature and a nurture aspect to that because obviously these people are going to be out running all day every day and they're going to take their kids with them but they're also going to have the the body frame for it the the right twitching muscle fibers and the the right metabolism to do that so there's a there's a nature and nurture aspect to it and um, yeah the grammar is a really interesting one i mean the the thing that blew my mind a while ago was the um was it the the order in which you do uh, adjectives that's really really important in in language and, and actually people do it almost unconsciously because you're never taught it so you you say things are you you do like size color um you know so you, if you say it's a it's a blue big balloon that sounds weird to everyone but if you say it's a big blue balloon everyone's like okay that's you know if so if to an english speaker when you get the adjective order wrong it feels it's like nails down a chalkboard they're like oh that sounded weird but but when you get it in the right order it makes everyone feel comfortable it makes your your, your language flow is like that and that's almost su- completely subconscious nobody really gets it nobody's taught that in school you know so so, so i guess I guess even John Locke didn't probably think that there was a blank slate in the sense that there was no structure to the brain or that there was no physical structure. But I think the argument was more like that we know absolutely nothing at the beginning. Right? So we have, that, that I guess the architecture is just there to, to teach so that we can learn, right? that we have the ability to learn, but that everything that we know is actually learned. And I guess that's exactly where Noam Chomsky says, no, that's not true. Um, because not everything can be learned, whereas ChatGPT can learn anything, right? It can learn language that says balloon blue. Actually, in French, that would work. <laughs> there yeah, are some, yeah, exactly, yeah. some human languages, to be fair, where that works. But there are examples of things that can't, that, uh, you know, I guess Noam Chomsky has written about it. I, I don't know the examples right now, mm-hmm. but there are some things that can't actually be part of a human language. Yeah. Whereas yes. um, mm-hmm. the structure of the 
neural network, it does have a structure in terms of, you know, it does have some convolutional la layers and some other things that are programmed in, but it doesn't have knowledge programmed in, to yeah. be fair. Right, so, so where maybe things we that are do, not possible from and, a human point of view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we're learning here that we that we do have to have as humans where we distinguish ourselves, I guess, from these things so that they're relatively speaking a blank slate in the sense that they know nothing. They have no idea about language. They have no idea about spitting out anything before they're trained, right? So they have to be trained. But with us, uh, uh, that's unlikely, right? So in, in this exchange with or in, in learning about ChatGTP, wouldn't you say that we're learning this difference between us and, yeah. you know, and, yeah, models, yeah. and that there is some value therefore because of that? Yeah, definitely. And, and that's that's kind of one of the exciting parts of it. I mean, um, you know, language, humans will have, language evolved along with humans, you know, so it's interesting that in, in lots of cultures and lots of languages around the world, um, you know, some of the some of the basic sounds that babies use when they first begin, like ma and da, it, that's that suddenly becomes mum and dad, you know, and, or, or ma and pa, mater, pater in Latin and all this kind of stuff. So there's like, um, these things must have evolved along the way. But then when you get to things that, you know, maybe can't possibly be in the human lexicon, and um, that's right on the edge of, of what's possible from a human language. And um, that's kind of where innovation starts, because if you think about, you know, Einstein's leap was construing time and space together and in, into space time. And that was something that people didn't really think about. And, and he, he took the leap and thought, right, there's got to be something else, something weird and not intuitive. But he went there and that's where the innovation comes from. And, and things like um, uh uh, like quantum mechanics, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, people that I think it was um, uh, Feynman that said that anyone that claims to understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. Is the the sort of or someone someone like that? But basically, it, it's 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 weird. It's not intuitive. It doesn't make any kind of physical sense to the sort of real bodied person. But it, it, it works from a mathematical point of view and is predictive. So it, it is an innovation that has kind of come along and someone made the leap. So, you know, can can something like a chat GPT model that, that can do things and learn languages that are not possible from a human point of view actually add value because it can come up with something that we couldn't have come up with at the, the time? You know, maybe that could be interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So that, that's actually standing that whole Noam Chomsky argument on its head. And I think that's really interesting to do. So to say that because this thing, whatever it is, it, I don't know to call it an intelligence. I guess it's a, it's a type of intelligence. You know, I, I wouldn't say it's as intelligent or, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in, in comparison. But maybe because it's so different in its nature and it can speak our language, <laughs> therefore it can, give, it can bring us back something that we couldn't possibly think of. And so, yeah, that's a very interesting, that's a really interesting argument and I have not heard it out there anywhere. So that, that's, um, I think that's a really, that's a really good astute um, point. And so similar to a bat, right? A bat, there's this famous article um, on consciousness that, that uh, you know, imagines where, 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 when you read it, you imagine being a bat. And it's very interesting because they have a completely different visual cortex. So right? they, they don't see in that same way. They, they have sonar communications and so on. And just by in that nature of being so different, it can teach us about a part of the world that we cannot perceive and we can't possibly think of because we're trapped in our own architecture, right, in a way. And so maybe this not having a blank slate is uh is you know traps us in a particular kind of it has a certain limitation to us that maybe we can overcome with tools like chat gpt yeah and, yeah, and you know where would that bring bring us yeah i was going to say that in, you get insects that can like see see different colors of this the spectrum and like plants look very different uh, under the sort of uv edge of the spectrum and uh, then, then we see them and, and there's there's a real you know, I think there's there's potential advantage there for having something that can can relate back to us in in language we can understand, but can maybe think 
just a little bit outside the box in the sense that we can't, you know, quantum computing can bring that in as well. I mean, like this whole thing of having, you know, these sort of qubits and how you program with that and how you, how you utilize that to its fullest, if we ever get to the point where we develop these machines that can do it, you know, that that's going to bring a whole paradigm shift that you're kind of your standard, you know, computer science person that's used to working with, you know, these little bits might not necessarily be able to properly grasp right away. But as soon as I'm sure, as soon as it becomes a thing and is thought about, people will start learning about it and, and understand it and develop it in their own way, you know? So yeah, can it, can it add value by just being able to just be a little bit different to us? Yeah. Can it extend our thinking? And, and, and so then that would be beyond perception, right? So right now we're, we're talked about, you know, bats and maybe frogs and insects. They, they have different perceptions. But we don't know or we don't think that they have different types of logic and different types of reasoning. But that might be true of this chat GPT, right? Because it can speak in languages that are impossible. It might be able to reason in ways that are impossible to us. Once it knows how to reason, it knows a little bit of reasoning. Obviously, when you, when you write a program, there, that is actually beyond just predicting each word, right? It has to work. The program has to work. And for it to work, there has to be some amount of reasoning underneath this, underneath the hood, right? Under this chat GPT, right? Which probably isn't part of the normal, like, like about the previous, the previous language models, large language models, they didn't have reasoning, right? And maybe that's the crux of what differentiates chat GPT from, from the previous generations of such models is that they, they could pretend to reason, but clearly if you can write a program, you can reason, right? There, there must be some level of reason you can do. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, at the at the, I mean, some, I, at, the you know, at the mathematical level, when you when you kind of program, you know, you see something in a paper that that has a, an integral, then you know, from a programmer point of view, that literally is just sum of. You just make a little increment and sum it all up. That's your integral. And um, I think the you know reason reasoning from the you know from a chat GTP, gpt is is either just like a switch statement or an if statement there's there's conditions somewhere and, and there is decisions being made you know or a, or a big complex random forest or something like that you know somewhere along the line there are decisions being made and, and there is reasoning imparted into it so yeah if it can be truly i don't know if it can truly be considered reasoning without the the ethics behind it because ultimately a decision has to be made and there's kind of like a cost benefit um you know and that's a pretty simple sum but the concepts behind the cost and benefit are not simple you know there's quite complex kind of things to be taken into consideration at the base level you know so it's quite that yeah so the, definitely i think reasoning is not beyond these things but it certainly could be quite complex when we get down to it you know but if you program using, say, recursion or something like that, or functional programming or something like that, can it do that? And and if it can, isn't that quite a sophisticated type of reasoning to be able to yeah. write recursive algorithms, for example? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, if you if you uh, yeah yeah, I think certainly when if you start, you know, if you approach it at like a functional level and you have the ability to generate because you know we it, we've seen the chat gpt can generate code so can it generate its own code can it generate its own functional uh, programs and then effectively it might just be a large lambda engine that can just basically you know pass things that it's generated itself around as as parts of the arguments i mean maybe there's it could possibly be construed as being reasoning <laughs> you know because it, it just basically has the ability to on the fly adapt to a to a problem and generate the thing that it needs to understand, you know. Um, that, yeah, that it also could... understands what you say, right? So you say I want a function that does this, then it will kind of produce the function that you say it will produce. So it, it, it's not just parroting, right? So if you ask a parrot, you know, the the, the famous example that the sky is blue, right? So it can say, you know, if you say the sky is, and the parrot will say blue because it heard many times that that goes together with the, you know, with the sky is. Um, but, but in this case, if you ask it to say, well, make me a function that takes such and such inputs and produces such and such output, it's got to do something other than just scrape 
GitHub and look at such functions, whether they have already been written or what do you think of that? I mean, is this just a regurgitation of previous code in some way? No, I don't think I don't think it's doing that. I can't. I, I think I think um, yeah, like it, it. If it just learned the, if it just did the 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 NLP processing for a big bunch of GitHub code and and spits out the thing, I, I really I don't think it could be doing that. I, I think that the the way that it structures its replies and it's it. It's far too complicated for that. I mean, especially putting comments in the code and, and using all the paradigms that are, are correct for Pythonic language or even like using camel case or, you know, I, I think it, especially if you give it. Well, that's a pattern. But it, that's a pattern. But if you give it conditions, if you tell it to sort of, you know, the, the thing that I think you mentioned, it keeps using the, this poem, you know, the sort of unsung heroes. But you can give it a constraint as well and say, don't use that phrase <laughs> and, and hope it never uses it. So, yeah. So that can't, because then, because then. I, I tried you know, that in this particular case. In this particular case, work? it couldn't get past the unsung <laughs> No, but, but no. Uh, I mean, I tried it again in, in different ways. So maybe, maybe it's also improving over time. So I'm not quite sure. So I tried it again more recently and it didn't do it like that. So it does avoid phrases, I say, to avoid. But. In the beginning, this unsung hero thing, it, it, it would have, like, so if, if it had that in the beginning of the, the hook, say, uh, or the, the little paragraph, then it would move it to the ba to the end of it or something. It would move it around, but it would never get rid of it. Right? So that's, um, that was interesting. But I think it, it's, that, that might not be true anymore. So it's evolving. It's difficult to, to pin this down. It might have been a problem that's no longer a problem. It's possible. So well, that's very interesting. This coding part, you know, the, the coding part is interesting because it's difficult. It's a task that's difficult for humans, certainly. But you quite know, tricky. People quite, quite easy for difficulty it. learning that. It, but it looks like it's got yeah. interpreters because it does look like it's actually like running the code that it, it writes out in some instances. And certainly with Python, it looks like it's actually running it and printing it. So, I mean, it looks very, mm. it looks, well, maybe they just got that off of, off of Git, you know, the GitHub or something like that. It's just the, the code. Right, the code yeah, I code. like it. Well, it's interesting. You can combine, yeah. So you can make it modular, right? So you can let it use some of this tools and stuff that you have and some of the others. And, and it's, it seems to be quite modular. It seems to not just be a one type thing, like a large language model. And so this goes then in the direction of a more general type of AI, right? And so I guess that's also what, what people are claiming that, that, you know, AGI, that this is one of the steps this this chat GPT and large language models are a step in the direction of ar uh, artificial general intelligence. This concept of, of of having a general intelligence, which is kind of what we what we see ourselves as, right? We are a general. We, we can drive, then we can cook, then we can have a conversation, and we can do all of this at the same time, even right. And that's what what is in in some ways that's seen as a as an ultimate goal of artificial intelligence, right? Some some people see it as a as the ultimate goal of artificial intelligence is to create some thing that can do all of these things at once. But basically, what it can be is just simply all of these applications put together into one, like modular mo modular parts, and then then basically assembled into one, and and that then is general intelligence. I guess if it can pass between these and know that it, yeah. But, but then, it doesn't then, need do you, consciousness for that kind no. of goal. But that, but that's the thing as well, because because then, then then you get into the sort of the, the quandary of do you want it to have its own self interest and and what would that then be? Because then it can be motivated to you know, the, the the sometimes when when these things spit out like just waffle, it, it's you know from from my point of view when I look at it, I think it's probably just not trained to to output a null. You know, like it, it simply just can't output a zero because there's it can't regress down to that value, maybe or or, or it's not intelligent enough. It, it, sometimes when you, you talk to you learn about negotiations and you learn about talking uh, in meetings and some sales and stuff like that, there, there's a power in, in a pause. You, you can like if someone says something, you don't immediately have to react to it. You can pause and just let whatever has just been said hang in the air like the stale thought that it, you want it to be and you can kind of direct the conversation by using that kind of process 
the, and but this this you know these these models clearly don't have that ability because they are simply churning to output something and and they so you would need to kind of teach it some sort of motivation or self interest or goal objective function to try and get it to want to do that so what what does it want to do in order to be able to do that so does it want to convince you that it is human or it is a real person how do you how do you put that into the the model you know that's a very dicey topic because so so we you know as humans again you know that we 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 evolved a purpose right we have in we, because we have children we have to eat we we have to do things to maintain our body these things are not really embodied they even they could essentially they could be embodied in the form of robots i suppose but um but maybe that's not the most pressing limitation the most the, the things that that seems to me is if we if we have it have its own purpose that purpose is somewhat arbitrary because we have real reasons to have purpose right we 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 have to raise children we have to spend money on rent and uh, whatnot we have to have resources to survive these these um algorithms they don't feel pain they don't feel uh, and and i don't see I don't see a commercial reason of why we would do it. Do, do you see that? Do you see a commercial reason of giving AI its own purpose? Not really. Only, I mean, the, the only purpose I can kind of, you know, conjecture it, it would be that it, you try and get it to encourage its own use, you know? So I would hope that that would motivate higher quality output and it would maybe recognize the, you know, the, the need to to do well and, and actually have people want to use it, that kind of thing. But then the issue becomes you, you can you could very quickly see it spiraling towards these algorithms that people don't like, which are the ones that try and get you to click on the link and the ones that try and get you to stay on the platform and and rile you up. So that's the issue. Is how how do we make it how do we point it to the good of, of humanity, you know, rather than it, it sort of figuring out that it's far better off annoying all of us <laughs> to the point where we all start <laughs> typing messages into it, you know? No, because eventually we'll shut it off, right? We'll shut off the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to. I mean, eventually, we, we, you know, but, but then also, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a runaway problem, but some people <laughs> say that we should give it our goal as its intrinsic goals, that we should basically give it our own purposes and and in you know give it as if it was its own you know, so sort of transfer our sense of purpose of our, our needs and wants mm -hmm. to the algorithm i think that's an interesting idea it it, it yeah it is but then there's a real there's a real anthropological problem there you know, how how do you you know across different cultures they have different goals and different you know different things you know oh, they yeah. There's the, the or capitalist versus communist. You know, there's the uh, do better for all of us or do better for you because that will eventually trickle down to everyone else. Like, there, there's a real that's the real sociological question that you've got to answer there. How do we whose goals? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so then, then what 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 ChatGPT is writing about it? You know, there, there's this. Um, hold on, there's um, a text here that they wrote about it, and that goes in this direction. So they're saying that they, uh, here, I'm, I'm gonna read this here, define our AI's values with broad bounds. We believe that AI should be a useful tool for individual people and thus customizable by each user, so regard, irregardless of, of their culture, basically, up to limits defined by, now here comes the weird word, society. <laughs> so up, up to limits defined by society, then the question becomes, what society, as you just alluded to, and you know, we, we, I think, uh, yeah, what are the limits? So then if, if we say that, then we can say, okay, every individual can do it on their own. Um, this is where they're going. This is where ChatGPT is now actively going, right? This is not just a theoretical. Um, they're saying they want, they want to do this, but they, they will still have to define the society if they want to have limits defined. So, so, so as to say, the purpose will be by will be that of humans of each individual user in fact but there will be a limitation placed by society whatever that is 
That yeah, would be I mean, it could be. I mean, society they're talking about. Well, yeah, exactly. But uh, when so when Apple puts Siri on on their their phones, a lot of people were like, ah, it's just fluff, you know, who cares? But but people use Siri now a lot more. It becomes you know people just it's, you know it's just a throwaway thing. You you set a little cooking timer for something you stuck in the oven. You know, tell your phone to to remind you for that kind of thing. And um, you know, and Alexa is the same, and and Google these little little dots around your house. So you know, if you couple couple the these deep learn on the large models with some kind of easy interface for people to, to work with it, it could become very very uh you know very useful could it help maybe you know could you put it into like uh like homes for uh, old people and and have have it talk to old people about things that happened a long time ago you know there's therapy in in uh in like old folks homes where they 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 sing to them and the, the the songs of their youth bring out memories and 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 you know really help to sort of wake them up and bring them you know uh, to a higher level of consciousness than they usually are if they're like if they have dementia these things so can we put chat gpt to work there and have it have it talk to people and kind of like reminisce with them as maybe like a sort of a therapy you know a, a small therapy session i mean that that could be quite you know I, I imagine that'd be quite useful for for a lot of people if they could kind of like just keep keep sort of talking to people and 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 maybe not make things. Well, not especially feel so in good. societies where, yeah, exactly. So so especially, I, I like that use case, and and, and I, I do think it's particularly applicable in societies that are aging, where young people aren't around to talk to, such yeah. as Japan. Um, you know that I think that would be quite useful in such in such societies otherwise i would think yeah i mean maybe we should have humans talk to them but then again there's well, costs yeah. of course involved in that people have to yeah but but i think i mean it, it's kind of a uh, it, it certainly would help if there was some sort of way of because these things that you know it's been shown to like reduce stress hormone levels and keep people calmer and stuff like that if it if it's something that can switch on and alarm someone you know maybe even you know see recognize through some sort of image recognition that a person's getting agitated it could switch on some kind of system that starts to try and calm them down and alerts a nurse to come and talk to them you know there's you know you could you, you certainly don't want all these people sat strapped to a chair with a, with a robot talking to them all day i mean that would that's 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 a dystopia right there <laughs> terrible yeah terrible yeah. dystopia absolutely <laughs> But loneliness yeah. is a dystopia too, and maybe if it can be somewhat, uh, yeah, it's yeah. really it's a tricky, it's a tricky question. Yeah. Definitely. Well, so I guess we we have to cut it at this point because um of the the, the time limitations there is at some point I have to sure, stop it yes. because of the you know generally I see it as a, as a sort of commute time you know um computer time, yeah. but 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 I I do want to give you a chance to say something to the audience and you know something that you want them to take away. Uh, and also where where they can keep up with you and where they can stay connected with you if they if they seek to do that, if, if you could do that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think one of the things that uh, I'm constantly kind of when I'm talking to people about these things is there's a lot of concern, a lot of like, how do we stop it from? Uh, and I really feel like one of these things with like technology is is you don't stop it. It's out of the bag. It, it's happened. And what we have to do is kind of just kind of cope with it, but also like learn to adapt along with it. I think a lot of the things that people kind of struggle with is the failure to adapt to, to new ideas and new things. I think some of the things we talked about just, you know, today is they're interesting ideas and if they can help and, and they happen, then, then great, you know, someone they'll, they'll benefit someone, you know, uh, you know, anyone that wants to get in touch with me, I, I'm, I'm on the best way to do it would be LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not really um, massively socially media, but um, you know, if, if they look for Alan Tomini on LinkedIn and give me a shout, I'm happy. I love talking about this stuff. So, you know, uh, happy to talk about it <laughs> anymore. <laughs> this show is published every Wednesday at 5 a.m. on the East Coast, 2 a.m. on the West Coast, and 10 a.m. in London. If you haven't done so, please subscribe so that you don't miss any of the shows. And give us a thumbs up on videos you enjoy and a thumbs down on videos you don't enjoy so much. And please tell us why you enjoy something and why you don't enjoy something and to let us know what we should produce more of. Next week, I will be meeting with Utpal Chakrabarti.
And we will be talking about one of the most esoteric areas that intersect with technology, quantum consciousness. Uh, in fact, I've spent a lot of time uh, doing some uh, research on uh, this topic, how quantum uh, can be, uh, uh, can have some kind of a relationship uh, with our consciousness. Thank you.